We have a lot of slides left, but um, we've been talking about chemical reactions and uh, chemical reaction uh, is said to occur if you've got new substances formed. And so, for instance, uh, we use an, an equation to represent the reaction. Okay, so this equation represents the uh, reaction. So we start over here. These are called the, remember, the reactants we we'll start with, and then the stuff that's produced on the right are what we call the products. We talked about balancing, and actually that's kind of where I left off uh, last Friday, and I want to pick up today. So um, we can check to see if it's balanced by looking at the atoms of each type of element on both sides of the reaction arrow. Sometimes I call the reaction arrow like a brick wall. Okay, so this is what we start with, and this is what we end with. Okay, and assuming that you're not creating any different elements, which we aren't, these are ordinary chemical reactions, we need to have like um, one black atom. Well, we do have one black atom, that's the carbon. We have four white atoms, those are hydrogens, but we only have two carbon. So that's not balanced. It's totally not balanced. So we can balance it, and we're going to work on this today just a little bit. We can balance it if we go with two oxygens, okay, sorry, two oxygen molecules. So two O2s literally means I have, there's one O2, and there's a second O2. Um, over here on the product side, when it says two H2Os, when you guys go to balance your equations, keep in mind that that two means that I have two water molecules. So how many hydrogens do I have? Four. Yeah, four. So actually, in this case, notice I have one carbon atom on both sides. I, the white balls are hydrogens. I have four hydrogens here. Now I have four hydrogens here. The red balls are oxygens. I have four oxygens here. And I have one, two, three, four oxygens over there. So it's balanced. Um, we. Uh, Friday called this stoichiometric coefficient. So this thing right here is called a stoichiometric eometric coefficient. And we're going to do, um, do a little bit of practice of coming up with the stoichiometric coefficients that balance the equation. So here, uh, when I balance them, I put a little squiggly mark, squiggly mark underneath where my stoichiometric coefficients are. So I think I did this on Friday, but what's the stoichiometric coefficient of CH4? One. It is just one, just kind of implied one. Sometimes students feel better putting a one there, but it's just understood it's a one if there's nothing there. Okay, so I think you guys had this slide too, didn't you? Did you guys have this slide? Yeah, okay. Um, so the whole idea of making sure you end with whatever you, or you start with whatever you're going to end with Okay, that's just a conservation of atoms, conservation of mass, conservation of matter. Um, so, I think I did this slide too. One of the things that you can't do is change any of the subscripts. And I did an example up here. Um, you can't change any subscripts, but you can change the stoichiometric coefficient. And that was the word I put up there. You can change these. Wherever we put a squiggly mark, you can change that. Um, and like we said with water, when we had, you know, 2H2O, that means that we had, what, uh, our hydrogens were equal to 4 and our oxygens would be equal to 2 because my coefficient is 2 in front of water. And this is where I don't think we did. I think I said, oh, we don't have enough time to do this. So, um, did we do this one? We started to do it, but then I realized. Okay, thank you. So probably what I started to do is I put a brick wall there, and you probably have FEs. We count FEs, we count Hs, and we count Os on both sides. So I put that. FE, Hs, and Os. And so on the left, the reactants, I start out, I have like just one FE, I have two Hs, and I have one O. On the product side, I have three FEs, I have two H's, and I have four O's. So you kind of go back and forth. And then I usually put a squiggly mark here, a squiggly mark here, a squiggly mark here, a squiggly mark here, just to kind of tie my hands that I can't do anything with the subscripts. 
So for instance, I couldn't do, on the reactive side, I couldn't put an Fe3. I could not do that. I can't put a 3 there. But I can put a big 3 there, but I can't put a little 3 substrate. All right. Um, so one of the things is uh, you leave the easy stuff till the low-hanging fruit until last. So honestly, I'm going to leave that Fe to last. What looks most complicated maybe to me Let's start with our oxygens. You're like, dude, so I got four over here on the product side, and I've only got one here, and so how can I get four oxygens over here on the reactive side? Can I use one in front of the H2O? Yeah, put a four in front of the H2O, and then we need to update. we we'll put a four here. We update our hydrogens. Now how many hydrogens do we have? Eight. Yep. So update our hydrogens. We'll change that to an eight. Update our oxygens. We have four oxygens. And then you kind of go back and forth uh, between the two. So, like, all right, so my hide, my oxygens are great, but my hydrogens are screwed up. So, how can I put something in front of this H2 to get, instead of two, four hydrogens over here? Yeah, sorry, I need eight of them. Yep, I need eight of them. So if I put a four here, I need eight of them because I have eight over here. So I don't think my little thing shows up, does it? Yep, I have eight hydrogens, and so if I put a four there, that gives me eight hydrogens. I'm digging it. So now the only thing that's not working for me are the irons, the FEs. So I have three over on the right, how can I get three over on the left? Yep, just put a three there. So that's just it, that's totally it. Dun dun dun. So I've got an in-class homework for you guys. Yep, so we're gonna take a few minutes and you can like ask each other or ask me. Um, so I don't know if we'll do all of these. Let's do the uh, let's do the first one together. So what I would do is put a little squiggly mark in front of the CR, a squiggly mark in front of the O2, and a squiggly mark in front of the CR2O3. So you can kind of watch me here. Do it yourself. Whoops. And then I draw a brick wall. And on the other side, I put my chromiums, chromiums, excuse me, and my oxygens. So I have one chromium, two oxygens. Over here, I have two CRs, and I have three O's. So you're like, oh man, this is a sort of deal where the, I'm going to save chromium till last because it's low hanging fruit. So I'm going to fix my oxygens first. So here's a deal where I got two over here and I can't change, I cannot change that subscript and I cannot change this subscript. It's the situation I call my, 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 my evens and my oddsies. I've got evens and oddsies going on. So if I go ahead and put a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this to a three, and so I update my oxygens. And now I've got six. And then I'm gonna update this to a two or change this coefficient from a one to a two. And you see where that's gonna give me six oxygens. So my CR's updated now. I've got four. My O's updated, I've got six. So now my O's, my oxygens are great, my chromium's not so much, but I left that to last on purpose because that was that was not too bad. Actually, that's the answer for that one. So I'll give you a few minutes to take a look at the at least the next three. B, C, and D, see what you got.
California, D is the D is the hardest of those four. This is a tornado drill. Please proceed to the nearest shelter area. Here we go. It's a beautiful thing for tornado drill. So in this building, this is the bathrooms are always fair game. So we can go to bathrooms, but so we want
Attention, attention. Attention. This concludes the tornado throw. Please return to your normally scheduled area. Thank <laughs> you.
kind of put this last one up here and I'll ask if y'all have any questions. And uh, you can make those others for you to think about. This is the hardest. What makes this so hard is we've got oxygen and two things over here. Thanks, come here. Here, good lord, maybe eight. And then I need to put a fourteen. I know it seems pretty big, but if I put fourteen there, that gives me fourteen plus twenty-four. And then update my hydrogen so it's time. So that D is the hardest. Did I get those two down? Yeah, so, so D, you have to kind of go back and forth and you end up with 2, 14, 12, and 14. And when I say 2, sorry, 19, 2, 19, final answer. 2 in front of the C2H14, 19 in front of the O2, 12 in front of the CO2, and 14 in front of the H2O. And it strikes me, you're like, well, who cares? And it's, it's like a recipe, I tell people. It's like if you go to make brownies, they tell you how much sugar, how much flour, how much everything you need to put in, and actually how many brownies you'll get back out. And so it's like as chemists go to make something in a factory, they actually have to go by this equation. They can't go by just grams and pounds and ounces. They have to understand how they react together. Any questions about any of those? So on your uh, test, uh, I think from Thursday I'll give you a, they won't be like D. I'll probably give you something like A, B, or C for balance. Okay. So the other thing, and one more slide on here, it talks about chemical reactions. And I just want to touch on this subject. If you ever like uh, gone to the ER and they want a cold pack. So they don't go to their uh, freezer, they go to their shelf and they take something and they like squeeze it or something and it activates it and it gets cold. And so there are chemical reactions that actually get cold. There are chemical reactions that get hot. And so um, the words for those are this. If it gets hot, if they want to buy a hot pack to you, um, exothermic reactions like, so they release energy, they release heat. Um, uh, folks that are going to be outdoors, they can buy these little instant hot pads. And so, um, so if energy is released, I'm going to show you what's called a, a kind of an energy diagram here in a minute. Um, this is showing you energy release. So this could be the in the beaker. This is sorry, beaker. This is Erlenmeyer flask. In the Erlenmeyer flask is a reaction that's happening and it's releasing heat. So if I would put my hand there, it would get warm. Okay. So this is actually what we call an energy diagram here on the on the far right. So the way energy diagrams work is along the x-axis you can kind of think of time, and along the y-axis you can think of is how much energy 
is there at that given time? So it kind of looks like this. Time goes that way, and this is how much energy. So it could have a lot of energy, or it could have not much energy. And if something is exothermic, it starts out with a lot of energy in the system, and it ends up with not as much energy in the system. In the meantime, if you have your hand around that thing, that's where you're going to get heat is going to be released. That's an exothermic process, okay, showing you heat is released. So, um, and then the opposite of that, we have a lot of yin and yangs in science, okay. Oh, well, sorry. But um, this talks about something that actually I didn't show here, my bad. But most of the times, it doesn't just go straight down like I showed you. It actually has a little hump here. And notice what the hump is. It has to, it, it has to take in a little bit of energy, and then it can go ahead. So this right here is act, what we call the activation energy. Activation energy. And uh, whether it's going to actually release energy like this, going down a hill, or whether it's going to take in energy, get colder, they all have activation energies. So here we go. Endothermic is something that gets cold. So this would be like your cold pack. I like the word endo because endo in, energy is put into the system. Okay. So in that case, oh, sorry, it's more origin is going there. Energy will be absorbed. Okay, your energy uh, reaction requires energy, and energy will be absorbed. So this here, if you were holding on to the Erlenmeyer flask, actually your hand would feel cold because actually in order for that chemical to reaction, the chemical reaction to happen within the Erlenmeyer flask, it needs energy. And it's sucking energy from wherever it can, including your hand, including the air outside it. So that energy diagram looks different. Instead of ending up with less energy, Okay, uh, when the dust finally settles, it's actually going to end up with more energy because it's going to rob it from its surroundings. So this is the energy it ends with, and this is the energy it starts with. And just to kind of make sure we're on the same page, this would be an exothermic energy is released, and this would be an endothermic. I know these are just... Uh, Terrible butchering of what you see there, but it's the same idea. So I brought along just a couple of white powders today. Here we have ammonium chloride, and here we have calcium chloride. And I'm going to put them in test tubes. Now this isn't a chemical reaction, but it's just a process. It's like it should have a I'll be careful. So hopefully... There's the calcium chloride. You're going to see that actually the ammonium chloride is going to be a white powder, white substance, but it's going to have a little different granulation. So you can tell the difference between the two. So yeah, you can see it's a little more of a powdery than so balls. Transfer it. There's ammonium chloride. And so all I'm going to do, again, it's not a chemical reaction, but in this case, the dissolving process is endo or exothermic. So I'll just dose them with a little bit of water. I think I'll send them around together so you can see which one you think is endo, which one is exothermic. Not new substances are being formed, but just the dissolving is either endo or exothermic. Can you tell the difference between the temperatures? Is one colder? You can't tell one colder. Mm -hmm. No, I can't either. Okay. <laughs>
Okay, so this is, I don't think these are very long. I hope they aren't very long. Uh, these will be due uh, when we meet again on Friday. Page 392, exercise 2, page 390, short answer number 11, 13. Um, and I'll just leave these two extra ones in case you want to kind of do them for review for the test. And then we're back to part four. Which that one should work just Mixtures. Okay. So, um, Part of uh, what I think is important is you have a sense of kind of the classification of matter. So we, I feel like we've been talking a lot about this little diagram. Matter is made up of atoms, and all atoms will will uh, weigh something. They'll have mass, and they will take up some space. And then we kind of go left and right from there. If you go left, we have a pure substance. If you go right, we have mixtures. And I want to focus on mixtures then. Because we already talked about pure substances, could not even be an element of compound. What a mixture is, is a mixture. You're mixing two or more things together. Can you go back to the. Sure can. I'm going to grab something. I'll be right back. But so mixtures are all around us. There are two or more things that are stuck together or that are just kind of tossed together. The thing about mixtures is that actually we can separate them back out into their individual substances by some sort of physical process. So the word is physically combined up there. Two or more substances that are physically combined together. And like the slide says, they will each retain their own original identity. It's kind of like a unity candle when, like, I don't know, people are married, but they're still, I don't know. They retain their original selves. The two types of mixture, there's homogeneous mixture, that's just well mixed, and then there is a heterogeneous mixture, which actually is what I call chunky sometimes. 
probably have put that up there so the heterogeneous mixture is just chunky well if that's chunky then the other one would be smooth i.e smooth same throughout so um i've got so how many people think so your choices are i'm going to point to this one on the left and how many people think that's a homogeneous mixture Maybe two. Very good. And the one on the right is the heterogeneous. You got it. Exactly. It's a mixture. And like the I've said, you can take any mixture and you should be able to separate it back out to its components. You can use tweezers over here for this heterogeneous mixture and kind of separate the different colors of uh, little rock, little pebbles that make that sand. And for this one, assuming it's just some sort of uh, Blue, you, you could uh, maybe drive off the water, evaporate the water, and, and get the get the what was mixed, making the blue. Um, I think I have my been lower done in here. Each substance will keep its its own the same chemical property it came before we mixed. And then this is why I brought this. We can actually um, change up how much um, of each component you have. So of course I have water here and I have sugar here. And uh, this actually kind of leads way to nothing you know, I talk about mixtures. You figure the property, the sweetness property of the water will change depending upon how much sugar I put. Right? So there we go. That's how I like my food. Right now, by the way, if I were to just kind of take a snapshot here, you guys would buy this as heterogeneous because it's got some solid down here and some liquid or liquid up here. So it's chunky. It's not the same throughout. Assuming it all dissolves, it will be going to this mixture. Oh, sorry, the word is very up there. Very. And like I said before, we can go ahead and get our components back by some sort of, not chemical reaction, but some sort of physical process. And evaporation is a physical process. So we can just go ahead and evaporate off the water and get our sugar back in. So this is sugar and water, but mixtures don't have to be solids and liquids. Uh, actually, in this room right now, we have um, this situation here. We have, uh, we're breathing mostly nitrogen and some oxygen. And it's about an 80 20 mixture. So, and in the water down there, the ocean water, the cute little red and white molecules, those of course are water molecules, and the pluses or minus are the salt that's dissolved in the water. So, mixtures can be homogeneous, the same throughout, or they can be heterogeneous. Um, but we use the word solution to actually also represent a homogeneous solution, excuse me, a homogeneous mixture. Um, a couple of S things that go along with solution. We have the word solvent and solute. So solute in the case up here would be the sugar. The solvent in the case up here would be the water. So you think of the solvent as the big amount and uh, solute is a little bit that you add. If your solvent, such as the case up here, is water, then that's an aqueous solution, that's an aqueous sugar solution. Okay. Um, so this actually, you guys all know this, that if I were to dump more and more sugar, see that all did go away. If I were to dump more and more sugar, eventually it wouldn't all dissolve, would it? So there's a solubility limit to everything. Some things are more soluble, some things are less soluble. This is how our daughter likes her feeling. She used to anyway. I don't know. It's just kind of great. So we kind of have these different sort of situations with regard to solutions. We have an unsaturated, now the word saturated means, um, uh, means as much as possible. 
So if it's unsaturated, there's not as much as possibly can go in there. Just a minute ago, before I added sugar, it was unsaturated solution. Now I'm kind of thinking it might be saturated. I think we want to talk about saturation, talk about uh, humidity in the air, water vapor in the air. So if that all goes in, it's unsaturated. Okay, if there's still some left over, it's saturated. So saturated means that um, no more solutes can dissolve. And again, it's, it's a function of what the solute is. Actually, it's a function of the solvent. And as you might imagine, it's a function of the temperature too. So we have those three things. So this word, this talks about the sludge. And so I would say, I'm kind of thinking of a sludge then. Maybe. 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 There's, um, okay, so in general, we use the word solubility, and there's a number associated with, I could see how many grams of sugar per 100 grams of water can dissolve at room temperature. So there's a number there, and that's what we call it solubility. And here in a minute, we're going to look at kind of some solubility data for some different solutes. So it, it varies by solute. There's one more possibility, and the possibility is supersaturated. I think in the meteorology we talked about super cool. It's been so long ago. That super cool was when water was cooler and it's, it's a liquid state, but it was shouldn't be. It was in its liquid state at a temperature colder than freezing. So supersaturated means that you've got more dissolved in there than really should ought to be in there. Okay, I'm going to show you a video of supersaturated solution. So um, this beaker here is trying to kind of show you the dissolving process. Um, I just think we take things for granted sometimes that uh, we figure what that's trying to show you up there is there is a sugar that's leaving the sludge, the pile, and dissolving. And then there's some sugar that's actually precipitating back out. It's what we call kind of a back and forth equilibrium. So that's what's going on with, with the dissolving process. Yeah, okay. So I've got some scenarios here. Um, the solute is, um, these are little piles of salt, NaCl, and we're going to add them to uh, 100 milliliters of water in both cases. Okay, in this case, we're taking 30 grams of sodium chloride, putting it to 100 milliliters of water, okay? And notice there's no sludge at the bottom. So here we are upping the quantity. Instead of 30 grams, we're going with um, 36 grams. Check this out though, a little tiny sludge is there, okay? So notice that actually they've gone measured that little bit of sludge to be four grams. So that must mean that kind of the maximum or the solubility of sodium chloride was 36 grams of sodium chloride per 100 milliliters of water. Because four grams of that 40 came out. So that's where they came up with that. So that's the maximum solubility of sodium chloride. And that solution is saturated. We know that because there's some sludge down at the bottom. These are some different solutes. So this would be dissolving in water. And then you can read along the y-axis what the units are. It's saying how many grams of that particular compound can you dissolve in 100 grams of water. But notice it's at a given temperature. So a lot of times people, especially if you've done much cooking or something like that, know like, all right, so if I want my sludge to go away, I bet it would if I put it on the stove. The solubility changes with temperature. But it doesn't always the situation that solubility increases with increasing temperature. Um, I'd say that's the case. You can kind of see all of the curves go up as you increase temperature, your solubility increases, except for um, the, the red line there, the, the CE2SO43. There we increase the temperature of the solubility decreases. This is just uh, some still images of a super saturated solution. It might be hard for you to see, but what they're doing is this is a petri dish which, with a liquid, a super saturated solution. He has little tweezers with one little crystal 
of this probably sodium acetate. And when he drops it on there, it kind of brings it out of its super saturated state. This again, super saturated, that super means it doesn't want to be there. It's unstable. And this is actually kind of, this is what we say seeding it, and then it crystallizes it. So, I guess we got to this assignment slide. So these will also be due. I'll show you those videos when we start out on Friday. But go ahead and add these to your pile. Page 330 to answer number three, five, and six. And page 331, exercise number two. That's it, man.